Okay, hello, good evening everyone. My name is Brad Gottschall, I am the Lower Paxton Township Manager. And in typical fashion, I'm going to give a quick summary of this evening's agenda, uh, particularly for the benefit of those who may be watching at home on television. So this evening, the Board uh, of Supervisors meets in a business session, uh, it being the third uh, Tuesday meeting of the month. Uh, the agenda is as follows. Uh, under old business, the board will uh, hear a uh, will take part in a public hearing and action on Ordinance 23-04, which does amend Chapter 203 of the Zoning Code of the Township. Next, the board will take action on Resolutions 23-13-01 through 23-13. Dash 07, which uh, endorses and authorizes the submission of uh, Dauphin County local share uh, gaming grant applications, that being a, an annual uh, action item of the board. Under new business, the, the board will hear a presentation of the Fire and Rescue Services organizational assessment uh, from MRI and Director Koshiba and, uh, and Mr. Graham. After that, the board will take action on change order number two for the BC 2A, BC, and uh, 5B mini basin sewer system improvements contract. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Smith of GHD is here to present that item. Uh, after this, the board will take action on application for payment number one for the 2023 uh, township paving project. Following this, the board will take action on a lease agreement with uh, Santander Bank uh, for the purchase of a new uh, pl uh, police bureau uh, vehicle. Uh, following which, the board will take action on a number of subdivision and land development items to include a final subdivision plan for Parkway Farms Phase 1, a uh, final subdivision and land development plan for Elizabeth Village Phase 1, uh, a final subdivision plan for Wilshire Estates, Phase 2C, and finally take action on the improvement guarantees. Uh, following this, the board will finally uh, take action to uh, submit uh, to the uh, payment of township and authority bills, hear any final announcements, and finally take action to adjourn the meeting. With all that said, members of the board are seated and prepared to conduct business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gottschall. Call this meeting of the Lower Paxton Township Board of Supervisors to order. I'd like to ask everyone to please stand, and Supervisor Judd will lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have before us approval of minutes of the May 2nd, 2023 business meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved, Mr. Chairman. So moved, a second. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Uh, the Board of Supervisors did meet in executive session prior to this meeting, and well, I guess depending on how long the meeting goes, we'll probably do so afterward. Uh, this is time set aside for public comment. Uh, public comment is for an item that is not on the agenda. If you are here tonight to ask a question or make a comment about an item that's on the agenda, uh, you'll be given an opportunity to do that at that time. So would anybody like to address the board on an item not on the agenda tonight? Uh, please come to the podium and, uh, although I know who you are, give us your name and uh, address for the record. Uh, Eric Kessler, running Palm Farm, uh, Lingelstown. Uh, most comments are negative. Mine is kind of one of praise. I'll keep it real short. I had an incident a week ago, one of my properties, a uh, criminal incident. Your local police department is investigating. Uh, Officer Neely, I wanted to uh, uh, comment positively. Fantastic, very professional. And I wanted to just let everybody know that very good police department to be very proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we are indeed very proud of the police department, many of whom are here tonight. Anybody else like to address the board on an item not on the agenda? Again, please come to the podium and give us your name and address. Uh, my name is Sean Barrett. I live in Norwich Court. Um, I never been to a meeting like this, never really been involved. So forgive me if I don't know the process. No, but just say whatever you want to say. I spoke with Sam earlier and I have two things with the trash thing, which I'm sure has been brought up before and everything, but 
My first thing is that there's no opt-out. There is a lot of people, my grandfather for one, who is unable to even carry his trash out. And before with waste management, whether it was known by everybody or not, you did not have to pay for trash service if you did not use it. Now whether apparently it wasn't enforced and it was a rule. I, I don't agree with the non-opt-out program. And the second part is, which maybe I'd like to see how this is being played out with the financials, but why we have a current sewer bill that's already in place and a program and I'm assuming staff to handle all the billing for the sewer and the stormwater, the trash service, from my understanding, is going to be integrated into that and part of that bill. Why, with it being $5 a quarter, $20 a year, and from my understanding, 17,000 accounts, which comes out to $340,000 a year, why it costs that much more to handle the billing when it's going to be integrated into the current sewer account? I spoke with Sam earlier this week and he explained that there may be more administration with questions and as far as miscollections, won't people be directly dealing with pen waste as far as miscollections and if they do contact the township, isn't the township just going to contact pen waste? No. Okay. No. Uh, <clears throat> the township will be solely responsible for billing and collection. Uh, as part of the, uh, the bid, pen waste wanted $30 per quarter to perform that task. Uh, Sam and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Godchel uh, went and took a look at the numbers. Uh, we can add a couple of staff people and handle that task in-house for $5 a quarter, uh, which is a $25 per quarter savings for residents. So by us handling it in-house, we're saving $100 a year per, per customer. Okay. So, uh, so all questions, all delinquent accounts, everything will be handled by the township. Okay, and those, we need extra administration on top of the current sewer bills yeah. to handle that? It, it's a whole additional fee, accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, like I say, we're able to do it for $5 as opposed to 30. So, I get that. You know. I'm sure that they didn't want to do it. They probably uh, That could be part of it, yes, sir. So, <laughs> um, so you're saying it's two extra people that have to be hired on to do that? Is it two, uh, Bradley or Sam? Yes, that is correct. And again, it, it we are in charge of all the customer service arrangements. So we'll be coordinating all the schedule for bulk waste cleanup. We'll be dealing with all the issues with missed pickups, missed issues, any issues with drivers and, and drop refuse and so forth. Um, there are provisions of the contract of a penalty nature that we have to monitor and manage as well. So our staff will be doing that function. Um, we're yielding a couple hundred calls a day at this point and kind of playing with that backlog of individuals wanting to know more about the system and needing some help and support. So, I mean, it is certainly a very time intensive po uh, position to take over. Um, if in the future, again, if, if staff reduces or other costs are reduced, we can then pass that savings on to the, to the customers as well. This is not anything about making money or creating reserves. It's a segregated fund and we're going to manage it in that fashion. I mean, with being on the outside and not knowing, to me, it just seems like a lot for a billing system that's already in place. So I guess if you, from your understanding, it takes two extra people to do that, so obviously. Well, and you can tell it's not just billing, it's gonna handle all the calls and, you know, we're trusting their estimates. They, they, they know a lot with the sewer and how much it takes to process and handle those, those issues, but we've never done this before. So we're gonna find out, but I think it's a safe estimate. And well, and we have to keep the accounts also separate because we'll be getting a bill from Penn Waste and then we have to pay Penn Waste. Okay, I understand. Um, and the second part is why is there no opt out? And if that is a ordinance and there's no way around it, which from my understanding, what is the process to get that changed? Because my grandfather who is 94, I know that's irrelevant, everybody's situation, but people are being forced to do it. And I know that when we talked, there's been evidence that if there is no, if there is an opt out, trash will be collected on people's property or it'll be thrown out and wherever that is an issue. So everyone is responsible to take on that just because of certain probably very small percentages that will not dispose of their trash properly. I mean, isn't there a way to police those people differently than making everybody pay a bill when they don't need it? I mean, I'm sure there's business owners and other things that don't need the trash service. Why is everybody forced to pay it? 
Well, businesses and commercial are completely separate. So they already handle their own contracts with various trash haulers. Uh, but no, there is not an opt-out. Everybody has to participate. Because if you did an opt-out, then it would be a matter of, ad again, additional staff to police that and make sure that people were, uh, you know, not, you know, two people next door to each other sharing one trash can and paying one bill type of situation. Uh, and then if that gets out of control, then the cost for everybody else goes up. Uh, so the contract is written that everybody has to participate. That yeah. may, is, that, is that even a state law? No, that's not a state, no state law. law. Okay. But that, that's a good explanation of the okay. reasons why this has happened. And Brad, how long has that ordinance um, been, you know, I'm just curious, do, do you know, Amanda? I mean, it's been there a long time. I was just curious how long, the ordinance for the trash. Yeah, it was in place before the, the last eight-year contract. No, it's not new. Right. It's not okay. new. Okay. It may not be new, but it's new to me because waste management, they weren't, they didn't enforce it. So, I mean, it wasn't an issue before. Now it's being enforced because mm -hmm. it didn't matter before because it wasn't an issue apparently. I, I just, it doesn't seem right that all these people have to be charged that. I'm sure there's a, a percentage that just will not use the trash service and are forced to pay now. So to me, I mean, what is the process to get something like that changed? Come back to a meeting and bring it up and vote on it? Or is it as simple as that? Well, it would require a change to the contract is basically if and if you would, would and you would also you would also need to uh, have support to change the ordinance which I don't believe at this point we're willing to do and the reasoning would be the, just, the reasoning curious. is well for, first of all it's <clears throat> as as was just pointed out it's been like this for the last decade so this is not a change it is the same as what we've always done but if we if we had an opt out then we would have to police it we'd have to make sure the people were in fact not uh, providing service there would be additional cost to that you add in that additional cost and then the fees go up even more for everybody so it becomes very complicated very quickly uh, so at least for now with all the changes we've already had uh, you know we have the contract and we're going to enter into what the contract requires and I get that with the contract but if that was the way it is so obviously if you guys would allow me not to pay you'd be responsible for paying pen waste correct correct why was that agreed upon? Why wasn't there an opt-out clause in it? Or they wouldn't allow that? Well, again, all the, all the trash haulers were given a bid document. And the bid document, how many pages long was that bid document? Uh, well, between the two of them, probably, what, close to 200 pages? 200 pages. Between the two. <clears throat> okay. Contracts. So you have, you have about 200 pages worth of a bid document. And uh, what Mr. Godshall did was he put various different provisions in the bid document that they could bid on or not bid on in an attempt to give us some flexibility as to what it is we might want to choose and hopefully try to keep the cost down as much as possible. So we could put it in the bid document, but if nobody would do that, for example, the reason we're going to the automated trash collection system is nobody will do it the way it's been done. Every hauler who bid requires automated trash collection system. I understand. So if nobody will if nobody will bid on it, then it can't be done. So that was a stipulation of theirs that everyone in the township has to participate? I think just it's just, Brad, is this, do you know, or I mean, is, is this I, common for municipalities? Uh, well, we're confusing two specific topics here, one being a complete opt-out of trash service mm -hmm. and one being a, I think maybe, sir, as you're trying to explain the bag tag system mm. right i mean i think so they're two very so low volume users i'm not users. familiar with that but I, that was okay. the thing where it was like five dollars to put out yes mm -hmm. so they're kind of low volume users that th so they're the two different topics that we're trying to uh, discuss here so there's as mr henry had explained various a litany of uh reasons for which municipalities historically in pennsylvania have chosen to move towards a system where there's a municipal centered hauler that is required to be utilized by residents including illegal dumping uh, economies of scale for haulers um, a, a litany of, of reasons and then then the other option uh, that or topic is the the low volume user so that kind of bag tag system that's the system that the bidders uh, chose not to 
bid on because, you know, as an industry, um, they're mov moving towards a specific way of doing business because of the cost of, of that very labor-intensive industry. So um, I, I don't know if that maybe kind of explains a little further, but... Um, yeah, to a point, he's he's I, not going to have no trash. What's that? No, no, no household can have no trash. I That's not possible. I, I mean, I understand that, but people have alternative ways other than paying $103 a quarter to find ways to get rid of their trash. Whether it They be, don't have legal alternative ways, no. Um, okay, I disagree, but okay. Yeah, I just, I, I don't, I think it's, before it was not enforced and I myself was unknowingly, whether that's my own ignorance, by not knowing it, it was an ordinance. Now everyone is forced to do this, whether they're gonna use it or not. So it's just, I assume the township's way of just ruling out and making it easy to not have to police it and make sure everyone disposes of their trash properly if they decide to use the cans. Correct. There's not going to be an opt out. You know, uh, we we liked the idea of the bag tags, uh, but again, nobody would bid on it. And you know, to say that somebody opts out because they're going to have no trash, that's not possible. I get that, but it's just not possible. So then they're disposing of it in some alternate way, and uh, as Mr. Gotchel said, sometimes those alternate ways aren't exactly uh, environmentally friendly. So. I Mr. Chairman, if I could, mm -hmm. also, I just just before we lose this thought, a uh, very good, very good example of this uh, bag tag discussion centers around West Hanover Township. Uh, I don't know if you've seen West Hanover's uh, recent um, situation. They're in the same situation as Lower Paxton, having to, uh, you know, get a new hauler contract this year. Same same as Lower Paxton. Uh, they had bidders uh, put in, uh, you know, for various. Uh, bid specs just as we did in Lower Paxton, but um, essentially what happened in, in West Hanover was they were going to offer a bag tax system, but it was going to cost the same exact uh, uh, quarterly or monthly fee for their residents as it would have ended up costing just for them to get on the uh, the automated you know can system. So they ended up uh, just foregoing the back tax system completely in their in their contract just because it would have cost the same amount. So it's, you know, it, right right over the border in uh, West Hanover, this happened in, um, you know, like I said, it's uh, the haulers just, it's, it's, it's a very costly endeavor for them to, you know, have multiple people on that truck to have to get off get the bag, it's, and, and not to mention the administrative burden of having to um, administer a, essentially a separate provision of a contract. So it's, um, and I totally understand the bid process and I don't disagree with the number and like, I, I clearly understand that. My two, my thing is the opt out thing that, and there couldn't be certain exceptions on, on approval that could be brought up that if people have a reason or unable to bring their trash or have someone else to dispose of their trash in a legal manner that they could prove like, I just feel that there could be exceptions made on approval. Well, we 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 understand what you're saying. Uh, however, we do not have an opt out. It's been this way for in excess of 10 years, and that is included in the current contract. So, at least for the foreseeable future, it's not going to change. Okay. So the process would be to get a majority vote of the board. Uh, well, we also have a contract. So, for the length of the contract, it is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Well, okay. thank you very much for your time and letting me talk and attend the meeting. Thank oh, you. no. Thank you for being here. Please thank come you very back. Much. Yes, please come back. <laughs> Anybody else like to address the board on an item not on the agenda tonight? One more time. Anybody like to talk to us about an item not on the agenda? Well, I see we have a lot of people who are here who want to talk about items that are on the agenda. So we will proceed with that. Uh, again, thank you uh, for being here. <laughs> Uh, chairman and board member comments. Board members, do you have any comments? I have three. Uh, just a reminder, this Friday night at Heroes Grove um, Amphitheater, there will be a concert, a free concert, with our Parks and Recreation, the sponsor, and that will be from 7 to 8.30. July the 2nd at Heroes Grove, Laura Paxton Township Community Foundation, from 11.30 to 3 o'clock. 11.30, um, excuse me, not 11.30, 11 to 1.30, there will be food trucks and all kinds of displays. Then at 1.30, they will have a program from 1.30 to 3 uh, called Salute America. 
So bring your lawn chair if you have nothing to do on July the 2nd and please come out. Um, last night I attended the Council of Government um, meeting on uh, the Public Safety uh, Committee first and it was about fire and um, the EMS um, and thank you to the fire companies for giving me some information that I needed today on the uh, when they send out their letter for the um, their drive so that was one of the questions last night and then we had a, a speaker from Savory Citizen um, it's a communication tool so um, Mr. Zumas and myself uh, normally represent Lower Paxton Township at those uh, delegates meeting that's it okay. anybody else manager's report uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I have no prepared report this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this takes us to old business. And under old business, our first item is a public hearing and action on Ordinance 23-04, uh, amending Chapter 203 of the Zoning Ordinance, Article 3, to modify the Lower Paxton Township Zoning Ordinance. Um, Mr. Stein, would you be conducting the hearing? And uh, Mrs. Zerby is going to explain what the legalese meant. <laughs> sure. Uh, ordinance 2304 amends Chapter 203 <coughs> of the Zoning Ordinance, Article 3, to modify the Lower Paxton Township Zoning Ordinance to adopt and amend Section 306B2F, which is the <coughs> table of allowed uses in each zoning district, and Section 403D0, which is additional requirements for accessory uses to allow an auto fueling station as part of a retail grocery store use in the CN <coughs> Commercial Neighborhood Zoning District as a special exception. The Board of Supervisors have been provided the following information regarding Ordinance 2304, the proposed ordinance, the application for the amendment to the zoning ordinance, and a copy of the public notice. The proposed ordinance was advertised in accordance with the PA Municipalities Planning Code. It was in the Hummelstown Sun on Thursday, June 1st and Thursday, June 8th, 2023. The application for amendment to the zoning ordinance was placed on the Dolphin County Planning Commission's June 5th, 2023 agenda where the proposed zoning amendment was approved. The proposed zoning amendment was recommended for approval by the Lower Paxton Township Planning Commission at the June 7th, 2023 meeting. If you could pull the microphone a little closer oh. to you. That would be that. Are, are the applicants present this evening? Yes. yes, sir. Do you wish to make a presentation? Uh, well, that's up to the board. I don't want to <laughs> spend more time here than, 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 than the board would like. Uh, my name is Jim Preston. I'm the land use attorney for Wise Markets. Uh, has, as has been explained, we had a petition for uh, rezoning. It's to allow a, uh, a fueling station use at a retail grocery store. Uh, it's per, it would be permitted if the board were to allow it by special exceptions. So there's then a second layer of protections for the township uh, in that regard. Th we, we understood that the township was possibly considering uh, uh, making, these, uh, making such an amendment at some point in the future. Uh, the reason we ask that it be accelerated somewhat is that we do have a land development plan for the existing facility, which includes these uh, these these uh, fueling pumps, and uh, we thought it would make better sense to, to do it while we're processing that land development plan uh, before the township. So that's the reason for the for the timing. Uh, I also have here with me this evening, in case there are uh, any questions. I have Jack O'Hara. Jack O'Hara. He is the uh, VP for Legal Affairs for Wise Markets. We have Alex Arorbia. He's the director for land development for Wise Markets, and our project engineer is Joe Gurney. So I think we have a deep enough bench here to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs> All right. This is the time and date set for the public hearing and action on Ordinance 23-04, which would amend Chapter 203 of the Zoning Ordinance. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard on? Ordinance 23-04. Yes. You want to come to the podium? Thank you. Hello, my name is Dory Hoover. Um, I brought most of my neighbors from behind the Wise Market or the, the vacant <coughs> properties. Um, if you look at the proposal, um, of course they advertised it in the Hummelstown paper so that we didn't see it. 
um, for one thing. I didn't know about the Planning Commission meeting until the day of, and I have a mentally disabled adult living in my house that I have to take care of, and I couldn't just leave and come to the Planning Commission meeting. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, when the, the trees in the vacant lot were, were taken down, it exposed completely to Linglestown Road our backyards. And anybody going down Linglestown Road can see our backyards, in, especially in the wintertime. Now, um, my backyard is complete quarter, um, three quarters exposed right now, even with the trees on. And what we have is scrub trees and junk trees and poison ivy. And if it wasn't for the poison ivy, I think you could see all of our backyards. Um, but um, they put an access road in, and every time a car comes down the access road, it shines its lights right in through my windows. Um, last week, I took a picture of a guy on the access road get out of his car and pee. <laughs> and I have a picture on my phone of him doing so. There's a lot of things that have been happening in that lot that we need to protect our children and the people in that neighborhood from when this, and not only to mention the lights of the canopy on a service station um, shining in our backyards. I mean, we, we need some kind of buffer. We need some kind of protection against that. We need something. Um, like I said, I have a mentally disabled adult living in my house that has a state waiver and she is like the noise you know and stuff and it it's very hard to deal with we you know with medication and stuff it's just sometimes it's just overbearing where she just breaks down and cries and I just and trying my best to keep it together with with all this um, their proposal for their expansion will take tractor trailers down through that um, existing um, roadway and into our shine tractor trailer trucks into our backyards and then around when they use the existing forest, um, forest hills um, or by sheets, they use that entrance now which I don't know why they would want to change it, but that's what's in the plans, in their plans, is to take the trucks and have their pickup on their CVS, uh, their uh, prescription drugs. They want to put that as pickup windows, which will shine all those lights from vehicles right into our backyards, closer than what's on the access road currently. I mean, if they wanted to do something, just move this to the other side, you know, where the beer garden is right now, and maybe that might be an option because there's nothing behind there, you know. But um, according to the plans that they have right now, it will take all that traffic into our backyards. The canopy will shine the lights right in our backyards, and we have no buffer or protection. And that's why we're all here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard on Ordinance 23-04? Yes. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Lucy Weaver, and I live right directly behind the Wise Market. And I didn't realize all this was taking place. But now I'm having, like she says, Right behind my house, there's trucks that pull in, and there is a noise that they, they're having. It's loud, and the lights are there, and it's very difficult. <clears throat> I also have a disabled daughter that I take care of, and the lights and that keeps her awake because it still comes through the curtains and everything. Um, I wish I would have known a little bit more about the design that they're trying to put in there so that I know exactly what's going to take place. I don't know if there's a way I can have access to anything because I th I'm hoping that if they're going to do that, 
that maybe they could have the service station maybe on the other side uh, where the on the other side where see I haven't I'm, it's okay I haven't seen the diagram so I don't really know but I'm like her with all this that small road that's behind the house there's a lot of congestion and things over there that take place so I I don't know I think we need to have more information about the design of what they want to do okay so but I'm not against it completely but I'd like for it to be amicable for all of us for the store because I know that we need to have that grocery store there but it also has to be amicable for the people that live there as well so thank you for listening thank you W E A V E R Weaver and my first name is Lucille <coughs> and I look really bad today because I had a terrible accident in the front of my house I fell down off the porch and hit the concrete oh. and I would like to say a big shout out and thank you to your EMS services because they had to come and transport me to the hospital hmm. and they did such a they were so kind and I had blood flying everywhere oh my. And <clears throat> they they were so good so I just want to say thank you to them because <laughs> there's something that we can be proud of so thank you very thank much you. Yeah. thank you thank you is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard on ordinance 23-04 <laughs> yes in the back Hi, my name is Matthew Nicewinder it's N E. I S W E N D E R. Sure. Um, I just had a couple of general questions. Uh, could you let us know right now how many other gas stations are in the neighborhood commercial district in the township? I don't know. I don't think we ever counted them, did we? Mm. <clears throat> Um, uh, I'm assuming this one might not be able to answer as well, but I was just interested in the closest proximity of a gas station to a residential property in the township, especially properties that are on wells. We don't, I, I, I wouldn't be able to produce that information right now. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, I attended the June 7th Planning Commission meeting, um, and it was stated there, I just wanted to confirm that I understood correctly, that there was not a traffic study performed to determine any impact on Lingolstown and Colonial Road traffic um, with the installation of the, the gas pumps. Well, this is just a text amendment. This has nothing to do with the land development plan. So, so far, the questions have all been related to land development. This is simply a text amendment to put the language into the ordinance to permit a gas station as an accessory use in the CN. That process would have to go through the zoning hearing board for special exception. If that would get approved, then the land development process would start. That's when these questions would be pertinent, not okay. just for the text amendment. Okay, I apologize. Um, a follow-up question, and feel free to say this is not applicable as well. I was interested, um, is there anything in this ordinance as far as a setback from residential properties? That's the reasoning for my previous questions. Right, that would be a land so development. That, so that, so like the things in there about setbacks and things, that's not? That will all be addressed with the special exception. That's when you would bring those questions in for okay. zoning hearing board at special exception. Okay. Um, uh, again, I apologize if this doesn't pertain, but um, there are fireworks that are set off in the nearby vicinity, including aerial fireworks. Is that taken into consideration being so close to a gas station? Or is that part of the land development as well? Mm. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know fireworks being set off there. Well, it but borders it would residential be. properties. Right. That, that's something that we would address with property maintenance, not with land development. Okay. Um, and then there is a public notice section on the township's website, correct? Correct. Why was this not posted there? 
It was sent to be posted uh, on 5 4 of 2023, well, so it should be there. Most recent one is from August 24, 2022, so it's not being updated. We'll, we'll address that with our website folks. Okay, I, I mean, so people that may have wanted to attend this that do look at that section would have missed out on this. Just throwing that out there. Well noted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard on Ordinance 23-04? Uh, seeing no response, Mr. Chairman, it would be in order at this time to close the public hearing on 23-04, and the board may take action if it so desires. Who wanted to talk? Did you have something uh, more you wanted to? Uh, do you want to talk? Just, just briefly. Just for the edification of, of some of the speakers that came before me, there the uh, fueling stations are out near Linglestown, so they're in front of the store, and then the store is between the uh, the properties I believe that are in the rear that were talked about. Uh, th th they're separated from the fueling station by the store itself, so it's going to be out near Linglestown. Uh, there is a road, I think there is an access road in the back which has to be addressed in land development. We're required, I believe, my engineer could tell us more about it. We're required to have buffering. We can't be shining lights in people's yards. We just can't do all these things. Uh, so I don't want the, the, the supervisors to think that that's what this is about. It's not. So this, this will simply allow us to then complete the land development plan, which as was just mentioned, for the fueling stations has to go again to the zoning hearing board to get a special exception. And if that's approved, then that gets uh, built into the land development plan. And that's when all these issues will be addressed. I that's was going to ask, at some point, we do have regulations over how light is shined onto residential. Yes. So there are standards you have to meet. Yep. Right. And there's buffer requirements as well. And shouldn't, and for construction, how much do we control how those people behave themselves? As far as the construction vehicles? Vehicles, egress and exits. I mean, how, how tightly do we regulate that behavior and we don't necessarily, but we could get to that point with the neighbors during the land development yeah. process. Well, I believe the retail store is, is, is by right, the, uh, the store itself, the, the actual store. This is just the component that's out front. Go ahead. Um, I just have a question, sir. Yes. So the, when you're looking at the Wise Market from Linglestown Road, the field to the right, okay, uh, which is beside the um, God, I just want to make sure I have the, the correct yeah the the little area where all the uh, where Dunkin Donuts and stuff is to so the east. what to the east of the yeah, store to the yeah. east anyhow the um, gas pumps are not going to be in that field they're going to be out front in front of the wise market am I hearing it right they will be in a portion of that field but but up against um, Linglestown Road so they'll be at the, they'll be situated kind of where, where the, you know the bank is on the other corner. Yes. Sort of like out there, but it will be to the to the far right of, of our of the of our parcel. Not the of the, of the there's two there's two parcels. Okay. There's the one in the east of, that was recently developed with the connecting right. road, and then there's the one that's the west, which is where the bulk of the store sits. So it'll be on part of it'll be part of, on part of where our existing uh, lot is and then part of the 10 acre site okay because you had set out front that's why I was just questioning but on, towards the road in, fr in okay. front of the in front of the because you do have the in and the out and then you do have the service road that goes back right. so they're going to be behind the service road no no it'll, you'll, it'll be in front of the service road as you come as you come in off of Linglestown with a new access point you'll come down you'll parallel the storefront you'll then mm -hmm go out towards Linglestown Road to, to the um, to where the, the, the gas and go facility will be. Okay. So the situation is this is just the text amendment that we have before us tonight. Right. But the actual land development plan has several phases to go through and will ultimately end up back before us. Correct. So we would be able to weigh in to make sure that appropriate buffering, et cetera, were part of that yes during those deliberations 
Um, and just for the, the, the one lady, um, the reason it was advertised in the Hummelstown Sun is we are required to advertise our ordinances in a publication of general circulation. Uh, we always did that with the Paxton Herald, which regrettably has gone out of business. Uh, that would leave us with either the Hummelstown Sun or the Patriot, uh, the Patriot being significantly more expensive. So for budgetary purposes, we do all of our legal advertising uh, in the Sun. Uh, I would suggest that you keep a very close eye on our website uh, because meetings and agendas are all posted there. Yes, sir, if you'd come back to the podium. You had just remarked about being posted on the website, and this was not posted. Yeah, well, the agenda, yeah. On the agenda, the agenda well, was not the, posted. No, no, no. The agenda was posted. The public notice was not. Yeah. If you go to the public notices section mm -hmm. of your website, the most recent one is from August 24, 2022. This was not posted under mm -hmm. the public notices section. Well, we certainly will look into that. Uh, but keep an eye on. Uh, now that you've brought that to our attention, it will be. Uh, is, is this just a matter of the, that sort of fell through the cracks or? Well, the, the, the public notices section of our website is simply a, I shouldn't say simply, it's a, it's a good resource when it's updated uh, it says appropriately. That but It says it, everything is posted there, right, yeah. on, right there, that language is there. Yeah, that public notices section is just basically a copy of our ads that we send to various pu um, uh, publications. However, the, the agenda portal of the website is always updated. That's per law. We must do that uh, at least 24 hours uh, prior to a public meeting. So that, that's the section where, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Chairman, all of our um, you know, meeting agendas mm -hmm. are posted legally. Um, so, yep. But it, it is a bit confusing the way we have it set up. I, I do agree with that. Okay, thank you. But keep, keep an eye on the website for that. And there's a lot of really valuable information on that website when it's updated, which it generally is. Uh, so please keep an eye on that. If you go to the uh, website and go to the agendas on Monday morning, um, you'll be able to see everything that's happening that week, whether mm -hmm. it be a supervisor meeting, a planning commission meeting, a zoning and hearing board, and all the agendas will be, will be posted there on Monday morning. You can also sign up for email updates and things of that sort uh, on, on the website so that stuff is sent to you that's of particular interest to you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you would. That way everybody watching on TV gets to hear you and see you. Okay, thank you. I was under the impression that the Sheets gas station is going to be enlarged which is right across the street from that property because somebody had said they weren't sure about how many gas stations there were i saw something that said they were going to be closed i think in october and they're going to enlarge their uh, yes. station and also put in some kind of a restaurant or anything and that will be i guess right across the street from where um, wise wants to put their gas station Yes, they are, they are going to be modern. Well, actually, they're not modernizing it. They're, Redoing. my understanding was they're te tearing it down and tearing down the whole completely thing. rebuilding it, which they do from time to time with their store. So, yes, that's going to take place. So, yes, and I, somebody had said they weren't sure how many gas stations there were there. How many pumps? And then, I, I don't that, recall yeah. what the... And the next one is down, I think, at the Giant store. They have the going gas Going into station. Susquehanna Township. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay, uh, one more, if you would, to the podium. Yes, sure. Okay, if, if this ordinance is um, passed, that means that adjacent property will be redistricted or rezoned for other use because it's... Mm. No. Mr. Solicitor, it doesn't, doesn't affect adjacent properties. It does, it does it? not, no. It wouldn't affect the vacant lot that's there now. No. When that's you say what, affect, what do you mean? Well, right now it's, it's um, zoned residential um, restricted use because all that's allowed oh to God. build there in front of our properties is um, like doctor's offices, um, um, office building, 
um, something like that. So if this plan goes, or if it gets approved tonight, that means that anything can be built there. Um, a Burger King. Um, it, it, can, it can only be something for which the property is zoned. Okay, see, that's what I thought if we were coming to rezone that. No. No, this, this, isn't, is, a this isn't a rezoning. It's just a text amendment. Okay. <clears throat> it, it's amending the current zone. Okay. It's not a rezone. Okay. But also. I, I know this, this whole, <clears throat> all this zoning stuff gets to be very confusing, and yeah. the process is very involved. Uh, developers go through uh, an enormous number of hoops to get to where they want to be right Eric <laughs> that's uh, but so th this is an amendment not a rezone okay, okay. and and I'm like I said the canopy itself you know will shine it, it it's up high enough see because it goes from Linglestown Road the property slopes down so 20 feet up you're gonna see just enormous amount of lights in it, it doesn't Buffalo matter if it's in. up front of you know, but I mean, you can see, I can see Dunkin' Donuts clear as day, and you know, at night. So, I mean, you can see them working in the, <laughs> and that's all the way up Linklestown Road. So, just so you know. Well, I'm sure significant buffering will be something the Planning Commission will want to see uh, in the plan. But keep an eye on the agendas, because as I understand from Mrs. Zerby, next would go to the Zoning Hearing Board and then to the Planning Commission and then back to us. Right. Correct. Anything else, board members? Any other public comment? Okay, one more, sir. Sure. Uh, just to um, follow up on the question that was just posed, I think it's because on the township website under, I, I don't know if it's section or under the ordinances, it's um, 203-301. Um, that area that uh, is being proposed is zoned as neighborhood commercial. It says to provide for lighter types of commercial uses that will be compatible with nearby homes. Uh, directly underneath that is the general commercial district definition um, and there's specific uh, language in here that it says to provide for a wider range of commercial uses than the CM and B districts including uses that are more auto related such as gas stations um, so there's a distinction there that gas stations fall under the general commercial as opposed to the neighborhood commercial which this uh, amendment would allow for just to provide further clarification there. Mm -hmm. So it's worded um, that it's currently gas stations are not supposed to be there based off the website. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, seeing no further comment, would anybody care to make a motion? I'll move uh, that we approve ordinance 2304 amending chapter 203 of the zoning ordinance article 3 to modify the lower Paxson Township zoning ordinance as outlined on the public agenda so moved is there a second second moved and seconded and a reminder that this will come back before us it will be before the zoning hearing board and the planning commission and back before us again so I think we'll see you all at some point in the future as well uh, with that all in favor aye aye, aye. anybody opposed Okay, thank you. We need to take action on resolutions 2313-01 to 2313-07, and this is endorsing and authorizing the submission of the Dauphin County Local Share Grant applications. At our workshop last week, we had presentations from all of these organizations. Um, Mr. Gotcho, anything further to add? Uh, not really, sir. This is the, uh, the per the board's ranking, uh, the resolutions are numbered uh, as the board had ranked them, uh, as we have historically typically done. So uh, all these resolutions are prepared and ready for your action this evening. And then we will, um, j I'm sorry, just to uh, follow up, we'll um, be sending these resolutions signed uh, and as well as uh, a sponsorship letter quickly back to the applicants so that they can uh, continue on with their local share uh, application process with the county. So the last number would indicate our ranking as to the priority that we assigned to it. Uh, yes, so 2023, a, yes, so 2023-13-01 is number one, and 07 is the uh, least ranked okay. um, among them, so. Okay. 
Any questions on this? Hearing none, is there a motion that we adopt resolutions 2313-01 resolutions through 2313-07? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, aye. 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 And that now takes us to new business. And we have uh, Mr. Kashiba and Mr. Graham with us, uh, as well as our consultants for presentation of the Fire and Rescue Services Organizational Assessment. And uh, Director Kashiba, oh God, at what point do we let our friends uh, who are uh, joining us uh, electronically in now? I am trying to bring them into the meeting now, okay. sir. And let us preface this discussion uh, by going back um, <clears throat> over a year ago, uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, authorized the study of emergency services uh, in Lower Paxton Township. Uh, this was done after uh, members of uh, the Volunteer Fire Services came to us and suggested that such a study needed to be undertaken. Uh, it should be pointed out this is a study. This is the consultants. This is a result of the consultants' uh, efforts on the study and their recommendations, and it is the beginning of a discussion. Uh, nothing should be construed as having been decided and cast in stone because we are only at the beginning point of discussing this. Uh, and that was the purpose of having this study conducted. So have we brought our folks in? We have. I have the video up. I'm going to mute the mic because of issues between the uh, feedback and the camera. And I am going to minimize this and bring up the PowerPoint real quick. Should be projecting up on the screen. There we go. There we um, go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, members of the board, chairman of the board. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, and the fire companies who participated in the organizational assessment. This, I believe, is a key planning document uh, moving forward with our emergency services. I, I think just in the fact that the authorization to spend uh, the money that we did, uh, that you did, is for, of taxpayer funds, um, says a lot about the board. It says a lot about uh, each and every one of you and what you uh, look for in emergency services and what you're willing to do to ensure the safety of uh, the citizens of Lower Paxton Township, as well as the uh, ongoing operational support to the to the uh, volunteers. So, uh, with that said, uh, I want to introduce. Mr. Pete Finley, he was one of three that uh, came here from MRI and conducted the study. And uh, he'll lead you through the results of that and we'll be open for questions. That's right. Thank you, Director. Great. Thank you, Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board, uh, township officials, uh, Director, um, Chief members of the public, members of the fire companies, um, chief from South Central. Okay. Um, again, we just wanted to, on behalf of MRI, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to do this uh, study for you. Um, we understand that, um, you know, these types of studies are always
you know, we understand these, uh, these studies, the results of these studies, um, you know, always bring about a lot of, of conversation within the municipality. Um, you know, there's probably different um, uh, points of view, different opinions. But one of the things that we try to do with MRI is to make sure that we, we provide a balanced report. Um, we provide, we, we speak to a lot of taxpayer, or excuse me, a lot of stakeholders, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we try to involve a lot of different components in our analysis and development of our report and ultimately in um, our recommendations. So I'm joined online tonight uh, by two of my colleagues, uh, Brian Duggan, uh, who's calling in from uh, New Hampshire, and uh, Ray Gretz, who is calling in from uh, sunny and warm uh, Naples, Florida. Uh, we were the ones who uh, comprised the, the study team here. Um, I don't know what, whether it was the long straw or the short straw I'm from New Jersey, so uh, I got to make the drive out here to do this in person. Um, as far as my background, just very briefly, I've been involved in the fire and the emergency services as both a, a uh, uh, volunteer and career emergency services provider uh, for 45 years, 46 years now. Uh, I started as a volunteer firefighter in 1978, and between volunteer and career uh, endeavors, I've kind of been uh, at it ever since. Um, uh, both departments that I was the uh, chief of um, were combination fire departments. Um, so, you know, I have an understanding of the issues, the concerns uh, that, that relate to both sides. So with that said, um, we'll kind of get into the report. I know you've got uh, some other items on the agenda also. Um, so MRI was engaged to review the manner in which fire and rescue services were provided uh, in Lower Paxton Township. Um, we were asked to evaluate the fire and rescue services as a whole, uh, organizational structure and overall operations, and then, you know, kind of identify potential gaps and offer recommendations for uh, potential improvements. It, again, as um, uh, Chairman Henry said, you know, these are recommendations, um, you know, and there may be, we like to, to refer to our reports as a roadmap as opposed to a blueprint. And the reason for that is that a blueprint suggests that point A or part A needs to be joined to point part B at position C, okay? A roadmap suggests that there's different ways to achieve the same goal. There's different ways to get there. So we would ask you to kind of look at this as more of a roadmap uh, than a blueprint. And, and as the, the chairman said, you know, this will stimulate discussion and, and hopefully will result in the development of a long range strategic plan um, for the fire and EMS services in the township moving forward. So our goal um, is to create a report that becomes a useful guide and a resource that shapes a vision for the future success of the organization and the organization, the sub-organizations that comprise it as it and they approach the challenges and transitions uh, of the future. So ultimately after tonight for the most part, the outcome is up to the to some point the people sitting in this room, but also to the other stakeholders in the fire companies, uh, EMS, um, you know, what are the outcomes to this? Does this become a dust collector or does it become a useful tool? Okay. We her certainly hope that the latter is the case. Um, this report provides that the township and the community with 131 uh, recommendations and hopefully uh, those recommendations will be used uh, to set the foundation for a strategic plan that's going to guide the delivery of fire and EMS services in the township moving forward. But ultimately, the outcome is going to be up to uh, the internal stakeholders. So our methodology, uh, we interviewed numerous stakeholders, uh, both internal and external uh, stakeholders of the fire and EMS services. Uh, we reviewed data and documents. Uh, we analyzed that data. Uh, we evaluated on-site uh, operations, facilities, resources. Uh, we also conducted an anonymous online survey uh, for fire company personnel. That way we felt that perhaps they would feel a little bit 
freer, a little bit more open um, with some of their perspectives and, and that sort of thing. Um, and altogether, we completed 33 major work elements that went into uh, the preparation of the study and the report. So some things right at the beginning, Lower Paxton Township Fire and, and Rescue Services. Th there are very good fire and rescue organizations in the township. They do a good job of handling those incidents. They have a long and proud tradition within the township. Um, so the community should be justifiably proud. Right? And they do provide a good value to the community. Right? But the emergency services are evolving. The emergency services are changing, as we'll talk about in the next few minutes. Um, and the time has come probably for uh, some of those changes and evolutions to be occurring here. Okay? So as we go through the rest of the, of the presentation, there's some things to keep in mind. Okay, uh, first one is Lower Paxton is the low, the largest municipality in Pennsylvania that's still protected by a hundred percent volunteer fire protection system. You know, the suburb has now become larger than the city that it's a suburb of. Uh, the other thing is, and, and this is very, very important, and we ask everybody to please keep this in mind. It should be clearly understood by all of the stakeholders that the focus of this report and its recommendations is to augment okay, and supplement, not supplant or replace existing fire and EMS resources. Okay? So the recommendations that we make are focused on adding some necessary, what we believe are necessary resources while remaining or maintaining, supporting and strengthening the existing fire service organizations okay? and we believe that that is is very very important to be emphasized okay so what are what are some of our concerns okay well the first one is and, and that's a decision that, that the board will be largely involved in is deciding upon an acceptable level of risk for the township as it pertains to the delivery of fire rescue and ems services Okay. Th that decision basically forms the foundation for all of the other decisions that will be made going forward. It'll form the basis for that strategic plan, what happens, when it happens, how it happens, those sort of key decisions that'll have to be made in the future. Okay. Right now, um, there's really a non-existent um, overall emergency services uh, organizational and operational focus and management oversight structure at the township level. Um, while, you know, there's, there's the Bureau of Fire, so to speak, um, up until this point, that appears to have primarily been something that's on paper rather than something that is coordinating and directing and overseeing uh, the delivery of fire protection from a township-wide perspective. So the township um, bureau of fires, the overall fire and rescue umbrella, um, you know, with management or oversight authority of the organizations that comprise it, has really not been been formally established. I know that there was a draft ordinance out there um, that talked about some of those things. Um, so you know, that's something. If that has not been been approved uh, since we were here, um, you know, that's something that the we would suggest that the township look very hard at and, and get that into place. Because again, that's going to form the basis of, of a lot of other things as they're directed in the report. Okay. Um, each independent entity, uh, Colonial Park, Paxtonia, uh, Linglestown, um, they basically have their own uh, organizational structure. And again, this goes back to um, you know, the, the long traditions in many townships, but the members perceive themselves as members of those individual fire companies rather than a township-wide bureau of fire or fire department or a township-wide organization that's, that's looking out for the greater good of all of Lower Paxton Township. Okay. Um, So, you know, one of the things that we heard several times was, you know, when we talk about that individual entities is, you know, they, 
each entity kind of is within their own silo. They operate in silos. Um, you know, there's not any standardization of operations, procedures, equipment, training, uh, any of those things. And again, that's not uncommon. So certainly Lower Paxton is not unique in, in that regard. Um, but, you know, more and more uh, municipalities are making the move to kind of standardize those things and, and bring them underneath of, of that oversight umbrella. Okay. There's little township-wide training focus. Again, the companies train on their own. Um, you know, sometimes they interact with each other. Sometimes they do joint drills with each other. Um, but that appears to be, um, you know, more an exception uh, than a rule. Um, two of the companies train on one night. Uh, the third company trains on a different night. So, you know, the chances of those companies training regularly together is, is not very high. Um, each company develops its own policies, rules, SOPs, SOGs. I again, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. So there's three different sets of SOPs and SOGs for how to handle house fire. Um, you know, that should be done at the township-wide level. So there's kind of one playbook uh, for everyone. Um, there's a lack of clarity over whether township or whether the fire and rescue personnel are township employees. Um, you know, we know one of the concerns in, in Pennsylvania particularly is the Emmaus decision. Um, but, you know, there is an argument to be made the township is paying for all of the apparatus, the PPE, the, the insurance, all of those sort of things. So the township should be able to have some control over how those things are utilized, um, who's purchasing, how they're being purchased, how they're being maintained, uh, those sort of things. Um, so we talked about this, the township-wide Fire and Rescue as a unified entity exists as little more than a name in paper, uh, on paper, rather than in practice as a day-to-day -day provision of emergency services. So consolidating um, the three separate and pretty much autonomous fire companies, each has their own culture, their proud tradition and heritage that we've talked about of service, um, complicated by that low level of interaction and, and cooperation with each other um, into a single, modern, functional, uh, effective 21st century Bureau of Fire um, that answers directly to the Deputy Chief and, and the Director of Public Safety, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Okay? There will be some bumps in the road and, um, you know, it, it depends again on whether uh, the stakeholders are willing um, to, to travel over those bumps and, and stay the course uh, even when the water gets a little bit rocky or the, the water gets a little bit rough. Um, there's a staffing model that's no longer compatible with the community characteristics. Um, you know, this is a, a densely developed suburban community, uh, really according to the Census Bureau, uh, between the population and the square mileage, it's, it's an urban community. Um, so, you know, that those non-staffed stations with personnel responding from home or work um, add significant turnout time uh, on the responses. Um, it's just the nature of, of traffic, the nature of traffic lights, people trying to get there within a reasonable amount of time. Um, there's been, um, you know, we heard from a number of stakeholders um, that, you know, companies sometimes assemble staffing uh, only to find out that they don't have a driver for the apparatus. So they either are unable to respond or they have to take a piece of apparatus other than what was assigned uh, or what is expected from that company because of the lack of, of an appropriate driver. Now we talked a, bit, a little bit about this uh, just a second ago, but to kind of um, give you some perspective. So NFPA uh, 1710 uh, is the national consensus standard on staffing and deployment um, for fire uh, special operations and EMS by volunteer uh, fire departments. And what NFPA 1720 suggests for an urban community, okay, with a population density greater than 1,000 people per square mile, and I believe uh, Lower Paxton is almost double that, um, that for structure fires, 
there should be 15 people, or, or the benchmark, the goal should be to try and get about 15 people to the emergency scene or to that fire within nine minutes, 90% of the time. Okay. So we wanted to put that out there because that's something that, you know, kind of plays into a lot of the recommendations that we'll be talking about in just a couple of minutes. So staffing um, is particularly limited during the day. It, again, that's not a reflection of anything wrong in Lower Paxton. Um, it, it's, it's the reality of life in, in 2023. It, it's also important, I think, at this point to, to talk about just for a second, um, you know, the problems with staffing and, and declining volunteerism is not anything that's unique to Lower Paxton. It's not anything that's unique to Dauphin County, to Pennsylvania. It's happening in all 50 states from, from Canada to Mexico and the Atlantic to the Pacific. But it, it, Pennsylvania has a, a snapshot that they've provided. Um, I'm not sure if the members of the board are uh, familiar with the SR6 report uh, that was done several years ago by the state Senate to look at the challenges, the crisis in fire and EMS in the state. And one of the things that they found out in that report was in 1976, there were about 350,000 volunteer firefighters in Pennsylvania. By 2016 or 2015, that number had declined to uh, about 50,000. And I believe the last time they formally looked at it, about 2018, it had declined to 38,000. Um, I, I understand that the latest estimates post-COVID uh, have now put it at south of 30,000. Okay. So, and again, this is happening all over the place. So it's not unique here, and that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong here, but the township needs to be prepared as, as they move forward. Um, and we talked about the traffic conditions, making that, you know, at home response or from work response difficult. So again, being able to provide an adequate number of properly trained and qualified personnel to effectively, efficiently, and safely respond to all fire, rescue, and EMS incidents, uh, and do so in a timely manner. And again, striving to achieve those benchmarks, uh, both for recommended response times and also minimum personnel requirements. Um, and we kind of talked about, um, you know, the declining volunteerism. So, you know, all of the organizations at one time or another have trouble uh, staffing sufficiently. And again, that's just the nature of the service in, in 2023. Um, the other problem, however, is uh, that there doesn't appear to be a strong commitment or program in place to recruit and then retain volunteer firefighters. Um, the township did receive a safer grant uh, for this purpose um, that had some limited success, but the grants um, period expired. Uh, that, that grant was, was the three years that it was uh, funded for has expired. Um, and while the study was being conducted, it was unclear if it was gonna be renewed either by the township uh, or if there was going to be another application for a, a subsequent safer grant. Okay. This is one of the big challenges, okay? making that transition of the fire protection system from a fully volunteer to a true combination department that includes some career personnel, okay? career personnel who will supplement the volunteers. Okay, while maintaining a strong and viable volunteer firefighting force. Okay, so this will not be a career department that's supplemented by volunteers. It will remain a volunteer department supplemented by a small career staff. Okay? And the volunteer companies, you know, need to be able to retain some level of their traditional identity and heritage. One of the things that I think most of the stakeholders, uh, certainly even in the fire and, and uh, fire companies kind of would agree with us on, um, is that you know the lack of any formal system for fire inspections, code enforcement, um, general fire prevention needs, 
um, of a growing community. It's still significant, developing commercial base, but yet once, with a few exceptions, once a certificate of occupancy is issued for, for buildings, um, there's very, very little code enforcement or preventative fire um, inspections that are done, to, to, other than if they're, if they're based upon a complaint. And, and studies show that communities that have effective fire prevention code enforcement functions as part of a community risk reduction strategy tend to have a lower incidence of fire. So that's usually money well spent. Um, and as we, we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, you know, those people can be dual role also. Um, determining the most appropriate long-term model for providing EMS to the township. Okay. Um, you know, interestingly, one of the things that we, we learned when we were doing, uh, you know, some research related to this is that, um, you know, South Central EMS actually started, was started by the fire companies in, in Lower Paxton back in the 1950s, and at one time, ambulances were stationed in the firehouses, and, and then again, as that organization evolved, the, the delivery model changed to keep pace with the times and, and with their needs and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, kind of going full circle, excuse me, um, you know, one of the things that may be looked at is kind of bringing those ambulances back into the firehouses. Right-sizing the apparatus fleet to meet the evolving needs of the community. Um, the township really has too much specialized apparatus, uh, particularly ladder trucks, and, and I say this with the, the utmost respect for ladder truck. I spent a lot of my career working on ladder companies. Um, so I, it, it, it's a vital part of the job, but not every station needs a ladder and, and you have a, a number of ladders that, that surround you. So, um, you know, kind of right sizing the fleet is going to be important um, in all aspects. A, a standard pumper today if you were to order one today, it's probably going to cost nine hundred to nine hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you're going to get it in twenty twenty five or so. Um, a ladder truck could cost you upwards to one and a half million, and you might get that in twenty twenty six. Okay, um, so that's something that, that that needs to be looked at long term and, and globally. Um, and then there's going to be a long term need for a fourth fire station. Uh, one that would preferably be township owned in the southeast portion of the township. The GIS mapping that's, that's included as part of uh, the response, and there's a slide on here. Um, yeah, the next slide actually. Okay. Um, kind of shows this area down here um, is well outside of any, you know, recommended benchmarks from uh, either Paxtonia or Colonial Park. Um, so that's, that's an area that long term, you're going to want to look at putting a station down here. Uh, you know, there's a lot of room up here also in Linglestown area, but with the mountain there, um, you know, the development is not going to be as intense um, or densely done as it is in some of the other areas. So now we're going to switch from the... Uh, our areas of concern to some of the key recommendations. So keep in mind that many risks are also opportunities, and that certainly is the case here. Okay? So this report can be a source of idle conversation. It can be put on a shelf somewhere where somebody's going to have to dust it off from time to time, uh, or hopefully it becomes a means to engage the organization, engage the various stakeholders to plan for a vibrant future. You know, a, a top-notch 21st century fire and EMS organization. So the first thing is, is again, this is probably second after determining the level of service, um, is adjusting the organizational structure, okay? Consolidating the command direction of oversight of all fire and rescue operations under a single umbrella, which is the Lower Paxton um, Township Bureau of Fire. Okay? The time has come for them to be merged into a, a, a single um, emergency services organization, uh, the Bureau of Fire that's led by a full-time career deputy chief, um, and a new organizational structure needs to be uh, developed. 
once that occurs or that that has kind of occurred already um, you know reorganize the remainder of the fire and rescue services under the township bureau um, you know that would have to I assume would have to involve a standalone ordinance um, on the provision of fire and rescue services um, within the township similar to what Swatara Township did um, assure that the, that the Bureau of Fire is established as the singular uh, provider of fire and EMS or fire and rescue services in the township and that the three fire companies are sub components of that umbrella organization um, stress the township wide identity rather than the individual organizations uh, and policies rules procedures and training uh, should all be established and coordinated at the township wide level they should all be being done with with one standardization with one set of rules one set of policies one set of training uh, procedures and 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 those sort of things um, and, and part of that would be to negotiate that agreement uh, for the provision of fire and, and protection services between the various participants. Obviously, if you if you were to decide to, to implement these recommendations, uh, you would need to implement a revised uh, table of organization that's going to clearly delineate the chain of command and make it more effective by identifying exactly who reports to whom and, and what their hierarchical relationships are. Um, all officer positions from lieutenant up to deputy chief should be appointed at the township level and be filled based upon a person's firefighting rescue EMS services training uh, certifications experience commensurate with the position uh, that's being sought and they should also have to uh, complete a rank appropriate assessment process um, and a basic practical skills and, and physical performance evaluation again the days where our fire officers of whatever rank uh, should be chosen strictly by vote or by popularity um, is just not appropriate anymore um, in, in any emergency services organization we need to make sure that those people are qualified to be in the positions that they hold and again this is just one suggestion for an organizational chart um, where we have the township manager, the director, the deputy chief, um, public safety committee or advisory board, uh, which I talk about in just a second. Uh, here would be the three fire companies, each one uh, commanded by a battalion chief, and then you know perhaps at the township wide level, an assistant chief for training, safety, and recruitment and retention, um, an assistant chief for safety and codes enforcement, and an assistant chief for EMS if the township were to decide to bring EMS uh, underneath of the township umbrella also. The public safety committee um, should be reconfigured into more of a fire and rescue advisory board. Um, there should be a representative, or our recommendation is a rec representative from each one of the fire companies, a representative from EMS, but then citizen members, citizen participation, and, and they should have the majority of the board. Okay? They are truly the customers, they are the end users of the fire and EMS services, so they should have significant input into that advisory capacity. Uh, staffing and response um, continue to enhance volunteer recruitment and retention efforts um, you can seek another federal safer grant uh, for the purposes of, of funding you know recruitment and retention um, you know that's always something that sells well with the federal government um, one of the challenges for recruitment and retention though is that an effective program is very time consuming in and of itself. It takes a lot of time and effort to, to recruit the people, to get them through the process, um, to keep them involved, to keep them interested until they can get their fire won or, or whatever. So that can be a very time consuming process in and of itself, but it is money that, that's well spent. The challenge is, is finding out what is going to get the people in and more importantly what's going to keep them after they are.
Um, implement in-station duty crews to provide timely response to emergency incidents. Um, so for nights and weekends, a duty crew system, you have individual stations that could be divided into multiple duty crews uh, that provide station coverage. Um, you know, each station could take a night or a week or, or whatever where they're the primary responder for, for the more minor types of calls, the still alarm types of calls. Um, there's a lot of different models that, that organizations use that are successful. Um, the, the idea is to have the duty crew um, dispatched to minor incidents that, that reduces the necessity for the entire company to respond or the entire station to respond. Um, since they're already in station, turnout and response time should be improved. Um, and then, of course, obviously for more significant incidents, structure fires, uh, motor vehicle accidents that involve entrapment, those sort of things, you know, obviously the entire company would be toned out and personnel would be encouraged to respond. Um, and then, you know, trying to implement some standards of cover benchmarks and include compliance percentages. Okay? You know, we talked about the NFPA benchmarks. Um, you know, that's obviously the, the national consensus standard, um, but, you know, each municipality can establish their own. Okay, what are we trying to accomplish? How quickly are we trying to get people there? Um, there can be multiple response areas or, or, or coverage areas within the same community based upon kind of the characteristics of that part of the township. Okay. So the time has probably arrived uh, for the township to hire several full-time career firefighter EMTs, uh, particularly during the day, uh, to provide that guaranteed response to incidents. Um, and when volunteer availability uh, is usually at its lowest. Um, so what our suggestion would be, the reason why we say hire five, is so that there could always be a four-person crew on. So each one of those five would work four days a week. Um, so there'd always be a four-person crew on, along with the deputy chief. Um, so they could ensure that guaranteed timely uh, response to daytime emergency incidents and augment staffing at a time when it's, it's most challenging. Um, but there's, there's other reasons for, for that, you know, there, it's not just the emergency response, and these people would not just be sitting in the, the a station somewheres if they had uh, no calls to respond to. Um, you know, obviously, the getting guaranteed response to the 911 caller is, is vitally important, uh, but they could perform inspections and other fire prevention activities. Uh, they could be working on developing pre fire, pre incident plans. Uh, they can perform apparatus, tool, and equipment inspections, testing, and maintenance. Uh, they can perform basic station maintenance. Um, they can perform hydrant testing, maintenance, flow testing, and, uh, you, you know, they can assist the deputy chief, they can assist the, the director, uh, you know, they can even assist the battalion chiefs or the other chiefs, um, you know, with day-to-day -day administrative stuff or handling special projects. Okay. Under community risk reduction, um, you know, we suggest that a properly staffed safety and code enforcement unit uh, should be established within the Bureau of Fire. Um, with several personnel who are dedicated to doing routine fire inspections, um, you know, of, of multifamily dwellings, commercial occupancies, the businesses, those sort of things. Uh, but we would suggest that these personnel also should be qualified as firefighters and EMTs, and they can supplement emergency response personnel when needed also. The township should create a committee or a working group uh, to consider the advantages of creating a township-based EMS Services Bureau under the Director of Public Safety, and whether that's a separate bureau or a uh, or it's part of the uh, Fire Bureau, that that's something that you know would be one of those topics for discussion. Um, you know, we think that ideally Lower Paxton should have two staffed ambulances for a community of its size, both population-wise and geographically, uh, should have two staffed ambulances on 24-7 uh, with a third on duty 12 hours for peak uh, incident activity time. Now, we know South Central does have an ambulance right in uh, West Hanover that, that comes over, but there is a, a response time consideration 
um, you know, for them to get from there into Lower Paxton. And again, depending on where uh, the incident occurs in Lower Paxton. Okay. Kind of bringing EMS full circle, if you will, uh, you know, consider deploying ambulances from the Lower Paxton fire stations. Uh, we think that decentralizing that response model would decrease response times uh, by being closer to the emergency calls, uh, particularly in Colonial Park and Lingolstown areas, um, because they're, they're removed from that Paxtonia deployment point. And if you look here on this map, um, and again, EMS is kind of making a transition where it's not always based on response times, it's based a lot on outcomes and those sort of things now. Um, but from a response time perspective, if you look here, here is, is the EMS station. This dark purple shows a 240 second or four minute response time from that facility. Okay? If you look over here, if you had an ambulance positioned in each firehouse, this area here, this dark orange, shows 240 second response times from each fire station. So you can see that there's a much greater area uh, that's gonna be covered. So that would be, again, one of those areas of discussion um, and you know deciding how you wanna proceed with that in a future strategic plan. Interorganizational communications and relationships between the various entities uh, that comprise the, the Township Bureau of Fire have to be improved. Okay? Communications, um, you, you know, we could almost write that into any report because I don't think we've ever done a report where they didn't talk about communications challenges. Okay, but you know, the, the better the communication is, the better the organization is going to function and the more everyone is going to be on the same page. Um, so th there's also going to need to be an effort to develop a new sense of shared and common vision, maintain those open lines of communication, commit to addressing the issues identified in this report, um, developing and implementing that long-range strategic plan, uh, instilling a sense of organizational ownership in the overall fire and rescue organization, the Bureau of Fire, um, while recognizing the contributions of the individual fire companies, Colonial Park, Paxtonia, and, and Lingolstown, uh, and their personnel, instituting standardized SOPs, training, professional development programs, and instilling you know, that sense of team spirit or esprit de corps. Um, all of those things will help uh, to install a sense of pride in the lower town lower lower Paxton Township Bureau of Fire. So what's the challenge ahead? Well, making the transition in service delivery from the old traditional lower Paxton to the new lower Paxton. Okay? There will be bumps in the road. I can guarantee that. There will be some rough waters. We can guarantee that also. But but making sure to kind of keep a steady hand on the rudder and, and keep the organization moving forward. Making that transition from a volunteer system to a combination one, you know, that has bumps in the road. Uh, fully integrating the individual entities into a singular cohesive organization. There will be bumps there. Okay? Deciding whether to integrate EMS operations into township public safety. Okay? But, and there's also going to be increased requests for service in a growing community. You know, we, we know that following us, um, you know, there's several things that are gonna be talked about as far as developments and, and, you know, new phases on developments and those sort of things. You know, every home they build um, creates the potential for additional services. You know, every home and every business they build creates more cars on the road, which increases the chances of motor vehicle accidents and those sort of things. Um, and then, you know, of course, the, the ultimate goal is that long-term development of the consolidated organization, its officers, and the firefighters who provide that protection to the township. So a couple of final thoughts. Okay? Each of those 131 recommendations should be given careful consideration. Okay? Use that recommendation 
as the basis for that long-range strategic plan. View each recommendation as a goal. Identify those goals as short, medium, and long-term, and also low, moderate, or high priority. Um, stick to the plan, all right? But whatever that plan is, that long-range strategic plan, it's also a living, breathing document um, that needs to be reviewed annually and updated as necessary. How did we do this year? How did we do last year? Um, are we still on track? Um, or did something come up that makes us change some of those priorities? Okay? It needs to be reviewed in an ongoing manner. Okay? Involve a wide range or a cross-section of stakeholders in development of that strategic plan. Um, approach the recommendations strategically and systematically. We talked about that. Break them down into reasonably sized components. Um, we've talked about the categorization. Um, you know, go after the low-hanging fruit first. There is some low-hanging fruit in here. Um, you know, get them taken care of first. Um, if you kind of put it together into a plan, that allows a clear implementation plan to emerge that will consider which things can be accomplished with existing resources, uh, which items will require additional funding and or time to accomplish in the coming years. You know, for instance, that fourth station in the southeast, you know, that may be five or ten years down the road because there's a lot of moving parts that, that would go into that type of, of investment, that type of capital project in the township. Okay. Um, recognize each accomplishment. You know, refer to them when making recommendations. Check them off as they're accomplished. Uh, revise the plan as necessary. Uh, moving forward, just try Try your best to maintain forward progress. And most importantly, recognize publicly the achievement of the goals and objectives. Again, thank you very much. Um, I, I know we've given you a lot of things to think about, um, a, a lot of things that hopefully will spur discussion at the township level. And, um, you know, you have the potential to have a, a, a model um, combination fire department. You do. Um, but it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take commitment and compromise probably on all sides. So again, thank you very much for your time and for the opportunity to provide this study for you. Thank you. Members of the board, I had to go to my secondary communication plan here with my cell phone. Oh. So uh, the two gentlemen that have joined in um, online are on the cell phone they can hear any questions and if they need to they can answer through the phone hopefully so if there's any questions okay. board members uh, any questions on uh, I won't say the plan uh, on the study Pete I just have one it, you said hire five but do four tens so what happens on the fifth day well actually it would be uh, Four twelves. So, so you would have five people, but each day four of them would be working twelve hours a day. So it would come out to a forty-eight hour work week. So they would have one day off each okay. week. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, board members, any questions on the study? No. I uh, obviously it's uh, it's a lot. And we're going to take it slow. Um, I wrote organizational structure as far as the priorities, staffing, code enforcement, township EMS question, and unity, teamwork. So that's just the goals ahead of us. And you gave us a lot of good ideas and recommendations to consider. And now we begin to talk to everybody involved and figure out the best way to get there. This, I'm pretty sure I can speak for the board, this came about not as a, any critique or any complaints or anything, just it might have been the census or something where we just realized that we've grown so much and we need to start looking down the road 
to make sure that another future board maybe or or th these board members or somebody all of a sudden wakes up and says we waited too long we're way behind we're having trouble with recruitment and all that so a lot of this is perspective just trying to plan and not have to do things in a rushed way but you know do them in a way that requires them to be done but just so we're clear on the what how this thing started i think my memory is correct no you can correct me if i'm wrong it was just thinking all right let's take a look at this and see where we are and where we need to be and ha how we get there um, because we love our fire companies that's that that's very obvious and 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 your approach is is certainly a prudent one um, you know thinking ahead planning ahead um, you know with if, if the growth in the township maintains uh, what it has um, you know and again what's what's coming forward you know it's very possible this township could have 60,000 people uh, by the time the next census comes around in, in seven years um, so you know again too often places unfortunately wait until it's too late and then they're playing that catch-up game but I think the I think the, the key words that you wrote down um, I think are a good handful or handful and a half of good real big broad picture items that, that you're going to need to look at and consider and pete i want to thank you for um allowing the board to participate in this all us so i can't believe it's been a year since we've seen you <laughs> time flies <Yeah. laughs> well, you're welcome and, and and the board input is is obviously very very uh, important you know your perspective is, is very very important because it, it's your unenviable job mm -hmm make that decision or make those decisions in the future about um, you know what level of risk um, are you willing to assume for the township um, you know what level of service do you want to provide and, and perhaps uh, you know the opposite side of that is you know what level of service can you afford well uh, this is a study um, it is our desire to not have it put on a shelf and collect dust. Uh, it is not, however, yet a plan. Uh, so that will, that will be the next step. As I stated at the outset, uh, we're just receiving this study. It's, what, about 370 pages? Light reading. Light reading, yeah. yeah. I worked my way through most of it this past yeah. weekend. Uh, it certainly is eye-opening. And uh, yeah, my main takeaway from it is that we are the largest municipality in the state with an all-volunteer fire company. And I, I think that our fire departments ought to wear that as a badge of honor, that they've been able to provide that level of service to a growing community of this size and be the only one in the state doing it. Uh, so we, we obviously have an, a, an incredible volunteer base upon which to build. Uh, but we do know that we're growing and we do know that volunteers are more and more uh, a very rare breed and we've been blessed to have what we have uh, so it i think is the desire of this board that we not wait until we have an emergency situation or we find ourselves behind the eight ball uh, but much discussion needs to take place moving forward we're not going to certainly uh, we're not going to certainly act or determine or decide on any of these recommendations here tonight but uh, I, I do want to open up if anybody has any questions about the study itself you know how it was conducted those sorts of things that's what's before us tonight uh, obviously we're going to have a lot of future discussions uh, and I'm sure that uh, our assistant fire chief and our director uh, will be setting up a formalized process where we can begin combing through all these recommendations uh, it's going to take a lot of discussion going forward so any questions for these gentlemen on how the study was conducted okay hearing none uh, again thank you uh, this is a very exhaustive study uh, it by the way is one of three that we've undertaken uh, over the past year we had a study of our overall financial uh, picture and a strategic plan for our finances going forward on a longer range basis uh, we recently uh, adopted a parks uh, as a study of our parks and have launched a parks improvement so 
Uh, I found it interesting. Our population seems to have grown by over a thousand uh, just since the last census was conducted, but less than two years ago. Uh, and if we're headed towards 60,000, uh, certainly all this planning is uh, going to be necessary that we lay the groundwork right now. So uh, with that, if there aren't any other, do you have a question about the study, sir? Yes. Uh, could you please come to the podium and give us your name and address? William Miller, 4311 Crestview Road. The question I had was, did you extrapolate this out into the future? In other words, I think if you look at all the zoning in the township as to what can be built where based on density, you can go backward in time. This is about how big this township's going to be. So is this how much stuff we'll kind of need at the end? I mean, that goes for schools. It goes for everything. Did you, I mean, I, I just don't know how big this township can get. So to, to answer that question. Back, back to the microphone, please. You know, that, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things that we try to do in our reports um, is to kind of look at that projected growth in, in a community. If a community, you know, has been flat on, on growth or has even lost population, I, I mean, that tells one story. Um, a, a place like Lower Paxton uh, tells a different story uh, because of that growth that's been occurring, the, the part or future growth that can be anticipated here. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, you will take into consideration perhaps as, as you develop your long range plan is, you know, we, we recommend a fourth station. You know, we believe that'll provide that 240 second response to most of the, the heavily developed areas of, of the township. Um, you know, the only thing that, that in the far future probably long after any of us are, are still around, um, would be if the development gets much, much denser. So if there starts to be a, 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 a redevelopment movement that you know tears down two-story apartment buildings and builds six-story apartment buildings, obviously that increases the density, that increases the traffic, those sort of things. Um, but again, fortunately, all of those things now are required to be sprinklered. Well, certainly we do know that uh, the housing market for well, all of South Central Pennsylvania uh, is very robust and uh, the demand is far exceeding supply. So I think that would tell us that we're likely going to continue to see uh, more developments, uh, development plans brought before us going forward. So anybody else, anything at this time? Well, we look forward to having a lot of discussions in the future. Thank you, and thank your firm for doing an outstanding job. Uh, Director, uh, thank you for uh, helping lead this effort, and uh, uh, this is the start of a discussion. Yeah, Director, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I do not. Thank you, sir, and thank you, members of Mrs. the board. Lindsay? Yeah, and Chairman, um, I just want to thank um, the fire companies for participating, yes. taking the time, Chief Campbell from South Central EMS, taking times out of their very uh, busy schedules to participate in this study also. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention for a very important and detailed presentation. Uh, with that, uh, we do still have a number of business items that uh, we have to act on this evening. And so we will go to 9B under new business. We need to take action on change order number two for the BC 2A, BC, and 5B mini basin sewer system improvement contracts. I'm sure somebody understands what all that means. <laughs> so. Uh, Mr. Godshaw, anything to, oh, that, there we go, Mrs. Smith, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. All right, as you said, I'm here tonight to um, present the change order number two for the BC2 project. That's the project over in the blues over by um, Lingolstown, or sorry, um, 81 and uh, Mountain Road, that, that area over there, all the blue streets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this change order, like I said, is the second change order for this project. It's gonna be the last one. So we are just adjusting the final quantities to the actual quantities and raising the contingency amount. Um, there was a line item for just ra random contingency items that came through uh, as part of general construction. 
So you, so you can see the original contract price started at about 16.9 million. Change order one uh, was to do some additional stormwater work for 152,000. Um, and this change order to adjust the final quantities and increase the contingency adds another $98,000, which brings the total contract up to 17.2, a little bit under 17.2 million, um, which is about 1.5% of the contract. So the increase isn't, isn't substantial um, when you look at a percentage basis of it. But that's about it. It's just to adjust the final quantities and things. And then when this is passed, um, I will work with uh, PenVest to change out that, to close out of that loan. Questions, board members? Okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion on the application for payment, uh, for, uh, um, action on change order, okay, I'm going to get this correct here. Is there a motion on change order number two? or BC to ABC and 5B mini basins? So moved. So moved, is there a second? Second. All in favor, aye? Aye. aye. You didn't want to repeat all that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we also need to take, thank you, Mrs. Smith. We act, need to take action on application for payment number one from New Enterprise Stone and Lime Company for the 2023 Lower Paxton Township paving project, Mr. Godshall. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, not much to this pay application. It's the project's really just getting started. So uh, pay app number one authorizes payment in the amount of $38,676.60 to the contractor New Enterprise Stone and Lime uh, Company Incorporated for the 2023 Township Paving Project. $38,000? Yes, Do they pave two feet? Yeah, yeah, they didn't get the paving yet, so. You don't get much for $38,000 these days. <laughs> that's just mo primarily <laughs> mobilization, so. And any questions? Yeah, Brad, have we used them before? I don't remember that name. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't recall the, the exact project, but it's. Okay. It's, and H just, HRG certainly as well has been. Okay. Oh, they're, they're one of the largest firms in the state. I, yeah, but I don't remember that name you know, coming before uh, us. When I worked for the Turnpike Commission, they did a huge amount of work for us over okay. there. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, is there a motion to uh, approve the application for payment number one? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve application for payment number one from New Enterprise Stone and Lime Company, Inc. for the 2023 Lower Paxton Township paging, Paving Project in the amount of $38,676.60. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Action on a lease agreement with Santander Bank for a 2023 Ford Maverick. That was in your packet. Mr. Miller, do you have anything to add? I would say, Mr. Chairman and board members, uh, this is in relation to our auto task force individual with the police department. Uh, this vehicle lease, as well as the position itself and all benefits and related costs are fully funded by a Pennsylvania State Police grant. Oh. Mm. Okay, nice. Questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to <laughs> approve the lease agreement with Santander Bank? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the agreement with Santander Bank for the 2023 Ford Maverick. So moved is there a second? Second. All in favor, aye? Aye. This now takes us to subdivision and land development. We need to take action on a final subdivision plan for Parkway Farms Phase 1. Mrs. Serby. Yes, good you've evening. You've been patient this evening, as have everybody here for land development. Thank you for your patience uh, in sitting through a long agenda this evening. Yes, the final subdivision plan for Parkway Farms Phase 1 consists of 32 dwelling lots, two open space lots, and the residual tract, which totals 31.6 acres. Parcel 35004030 will be consolidated with the residual tract, which will serve as future Phase 2 of the development. The site is on the R1 Low Density Residential Zoning District with the open space development overlay. Public streets will be offered for dedication to the township and the site will be served by public water and sewer. The plan was approved at the June 7, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. The plan has five administrative comments and four general comments to be satisfied prior to recording the plan. And Tim Mallott from Mallott Engineering is here to address any comments for the board. 
Good evening. Oh, good evening. Thank you for your time, Tim Allott. Uh, thank you for the uh, summary. I'm just happy to answer any questions you might have regarding the uh, project. Tim, Tri-County Planning Commission, um, it said, you know, with their comments, we didn't see the comments. Are there a lot of comments that they have a concern? No, no, they only had like four comments. One of them was regarding our sidewalks, which we did extend another section of sidewalk over to Automotive Drive, so. Okay. Yes. And you're okay, there's hardly any comments for us, but you're okay with We're everything? in receipt of the comments and in agreement with the comments. Anybody else? <clears throat> Seeing no additional questions, is there a motion on the final subdivision plan, subdivision plan for Parkway Farms Phase 1? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Thank there you very go. much. You waited a long time for a short appearance. <laughs> All right. Thank you much. We also need to take action on a final subdivision and land development plan for Elizabeth Village Phase 1, Plan 2315. Mrs. Zerby. Yes, the Elizabeth Village Phase 1 proposes to consolidate four existing tracks located off Colonial Road into one parcel totaling 48.013 acres. Phase 1 of the development contains 17 acres to be developed that will consist of 78 townhome units with 12 buildings along with the construction of five private streets. The site is currently zoned IN Institutional which allows for the residential retirement development option that generally accommodates residents aged 55 and older. Private streets are proposed for the development and the community will be served by public water and public sewer. The plan was approved at the June 7, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. This plan comes before the board this evening with three waiver requests. Staff supports all three of those waiver requests. There are three administrative comments and four general comments to be satisfied with the conditional approval of the plan. And Doug Gossick from William Site Civil and Eric Kessler, the developer, are both here this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, as Amanda said, uh, we're aware of the, the comments, I believe three admin, four uh, uh, other comments. We have no issues with them. Uh, this is a plan that you actually approved earlier this month in its preliminary form. So I think you're familiar with it. This is phase 178 units. Uh, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? Gentlemen, lady? Okay. No questions. Uh, you're correct. It was before us not too long ago. So is there a motion on the final subdivision land development plan for Elizabeth Village Phase 1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 There we go. Thank you. All set. Thank you, gentlemen, for your patience as well. And we also have to take action on a final subdivision plan for Wilshire Estates Phase 2C. Yes, Phase 2C will consist of a total area of 13.91 acres to be developed in accordance with the plan. Phase 2C will contain a total of 16 single-family dwelling lots with one open space lot. The site is in the low density residential zoning district and the R2 medium density zoning district. All homes will be served by public sewer and water. No new waivers have been requested for this plan and a plan was approved at the June 7, 2023 planning commission meeting. There are four administrative comments and four general comments to satisfy prior to recording. And Adam Davis from Highland Engineering is here this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Connor Sergio with Highland Engineering, actually. Sorry. No worries. Um, not much to add to Amanda's uh, comments. 16 lots and one open space lots. Um, we have no issues with the comments that were provided and be happy to answer any questions you might have. Is this the last phase back there? It is the last okay. phase, yes. Thought so, but I wasn't too sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Who gives your last name again? Sergener. Would you like me to spell that? S U R G E O N E R. Okay, hearing no questions, is there a motion on the final subdivision plan for Wilshire Estates Phase 2C? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Thank you again. You're thank you. right at the very end of a long night, but thank you.
Uh, that now takes us to improvement guarantees, and uh, we need to uh, segment out yeah. Shadebrook. Uh, so would someone like to make a motion on the other three improvement guarantees? I'll make a motion that we approve the improvement guarantees for Autumn Oaks phase. Wait, we just went Shadebrook first. No, no, uh, you can do that well, if you like. Yeah, I'll say make a motion to approve the improvement guarantee for Shadebrook Phase 3. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Lindsay? Uh, abstaining for personal reasons. Mrs. Aye. Mrs. Aye. 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 And now a motion on the remaining three improvement guarantees. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve Autumn Oaks Phase 3, Windchase Phase 3, Wilshire Estates Phase 2B. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 This now takes us to payment of bills for Lower Paxton Township and the Lower Paxton Township Authority. Mr. Assistant Treasurer. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve payment of all bills for Lower Paxton Township and Township Authority. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Any additional announcements? I have one. I did miss uh, Chief Campbell when I was thanking um, the fire companies for giving me the information that I needed for the COG uh, Public Safety Committee last night. And Mr. Um, Campbell did provide me with the numbers that I needed also. So I wanted to thank him. Anybody else? Okay, our next meeting will be a business meeting, and we will be meeting on Wednesday, July 5th. Uh, Tuesday, of course, is uh, Independence Day, the 4th of July, and uh, we hope that everybody will join us at Heroes Grove uh, the Sunday before, starting at 11 o'clock, as Mrs. Lindsay said. Uh, we have all sorts of food trucks and celebrations and a program on Sunday, which I guess would be, what, the second? Second. Second. And you know what? Um, July 3rd, I forgot the fireworks, at Lingolstown Coons Park, um, approximately between 9 and 9.15. And that's July 3rd at Coons Park. And that's free, so welcome to everybody. Well, we're going to have a weekend-long celebration. <laughs> uh, and then take off July 4th, so our next meeting will be on Wednesday, July 5th at 7 p.m. here in this room. Uh, seeing no further business, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.